So there's there's um, a lot of musical instructional material, yeah. and and I think our stuff probably is guilty of this. Maybe guilty isn't even the right word, but a lot of stuff is structured in a very sequential, linear kind of way. Yeah. Like do this when that's done, then do the next thing, and then when that's done, do the next thing, and. It seems a little bit artificial just because in the real world, life is like a salad bar. Right? You do a little of one thing, a little bit of another thing. And I wonder if there's some evidence to suggest that mix, you know, tossing the salad, mixing up different activities, like you know, if you're learning the three Chopin etudes, for example, you know, and you're having trouble with one, just switch to the other one and then come back. Like, does that make any, is there any evidence to suggest uh, that? It makes perfect sense. So in the, in the few studies, there's still very few studies about meta-learning or learning how to learn. But in a couple of very good ones, mixing it up was a, a key uh, element. What it was the specific, uh, or what kind of activity was it? Well, suppose you, uh, there's something we call rotational learning where your mouse gets rotated. Uh -huh. Okay, You can imagine that it's rotated and you adjust. Right. And, uh, and there's something called gain, gain learning, which is expansion okay. uh, or contraction of how far it, uh, it goes. Oh, the scaling of the size of the guitar. Yeah. You can then put... Uh, attach your uh, mouse to a robot arm that imposes resistance. Right. Mm -hmm. Every time you go right, you have to push a little harder. Every mm -hmm. time you go left, you have to push less hard. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the force learning, force adaptation. Okay. To adapt to perturbations along those three dimensions, mm -hmm. then practicing the three dimensions in a mixed up way is necessary. You're talking about the scale adaptations, the force adaptations, uh, not just the, doing and the rotation, not just doing one at a time, not doing all force, all scale, and then all right. Um, and so based on how important, um, there are two things, mixing it up and also some uh, variability. If it was random variability injected mm -hmm. in, uh, in the, uh, the task, it helped people generalize and uh, learn better. Okay. So my hunch would be, and I'm someone who learned the piano by spending four hours on one, on half of a piece by Bach. Right. And learning that passage over and over again. Mm -hmm. And then moving on to the next higher speed right. in that piece. Next, moving on. But looking back, I will mix it up. So I wonder then, how do you know if mixing it up isn't just going to confuse you? Because I think that's probably what a lot of people think. Oh, well, I'm just going to do this one now. Because if I do the next one, I'm going to get confused and there's going to be interference. I'm afraid now that we've created this term and now everyone's going <laughs> to worry about interference. Because no, I, I think I think we should worry, but we should you know we should do what an educated person does when uh, you don't know the answer, right? You should worry, but worry shouldn't be a reason to then jump to a conclusion mm -hmm. and that makes sense. I, I think um, there's probably a trade-off. Yeah. You probably need to spend, you know, if I practice uh, one Chopin etude for two repetitions mm -hmm. and then move on to six other ones, right? it's probably not efficient. I see. And I may never learn it, mm -hmm. right? On the other hand, if I spend one month of the Chopin etude and never practice the other ones, I will never practice the other ones. So what you're sort of thought, you're thinking through here is how would we, what would seem reasonable and how What's would we test this? What's a reasonable balance? Right. Yes.